I've been in the past couple of years had had more negative attention than I ever had before. I mean, it wasn't overwhelming, but those of you who are on the novelty list know that there were some fairly ugly cat fights over the higher mathematics of the time wave, and. Uh, and so I got to used to thinking of myself as something which needs to be defended. Um, so that was interesting. Also, I don't know whether it's that I'm getting older or that the society is taking a sort of different developmental turn, but uh, I find lots more of what goes on seems uh, not only idiotic, but sort of personally irritating and confrontative. And so I find myself, at least in my mind, going through a lot of kvetching and grinding about, uh, about the situation in terms of public discourse and the search for truth and understanding. Uh, it's become... Uh, well, let me talk about this a little bit. In California, at any rate, and since we're in California, I'll talk about it more vehemently, because when I've tried this rap in England and in New York City, people say, we don't have this problem you're talking about, uh, especially in England. And basically, so what I've identified is a kind of social virus of political correctness generated either north or south of here a couple of hundred miles. And the basic notion is it has become uncool to point out, even to yourself, that somebody else doesn't make sense. Uh, and I've talked a bit about this at SLO. I've called it the balkanization of epistemology, which is a very fancy phrase for meaning you have to show due respect to people who can't tell shit from Shinola. You have to admit that it's a true, the search for truth is a very uncertain uh, enterprise, and that revelation is on an equal footing with science, and that the whole notion of evidence is hideously stifling and legalistic and uh, not to be taken seriously, so forth and so on. So um, I come up against this problem fairly often because uh, a certain portion of my audience is flakier than I am comfortable with. And so I've had to try and understand how this could happen. My thing consistently for 20 years or something has been in tight orbit around uh, psychedelics and the psychedelic experience with special emphasis on experience that it's not a philosophy, it's not a revelation, it's not a lineage, it's not a teaching, it's an experience. But my, so my fascination was with the weird and the fringy and the, even the occult and the frankly magical and the heretical, but my method was always scientific. It was never to believe these things. Uh, unquestioningly, it was always to take A.E. Waite's book of ceremonial magic and, you know, collect rosemary and steal the proper instruments from the village rectory and, uh, you know, save the host and then attempt the conjuration. And then if it failed, put a check mark after uh, medieval ceremonial <laughs> magic, uh, you know, does not compute and, and move on. So I, I grew up in a small town in a very isolated situation, and, I, and nothing about this seemed strange to me. This method of approaching uh, the occult, and I read J.D. Ryan, and that was all about statistically gathering data and so forth and so on. Well, somewhere along the line, 
And some people, interestingly, have suggested, both to me personally and then I've seen it in print, that these very substances and plants that I'm so keen for have somehow had on the mass mind the effect of uh, generally softening heads so that uh, epistemological rigor has broken down and rules of evidence have been compromised and now every half-baked intuition can come flooding through and as long as it has its coterie of bleating adherence it will take its place uh, you know in the great yellow pages of American Revelation as part of the spiritual smorgasbord well I, I abhor this argument because the whole point with psychedelics was to cut through the programming and the cant and the propaganda of culture to true truth, real reality, uh, not to just in initiate an era of intellectual permissiveness where uh, uh, everything in the spiritual marketplace was placed on the same pedestal as Euclidean geometry. And, and in a way, this is what has happened. So I'm interested to understand what went wrong and, you know, I don't know if anything can be fixed anymore, but it can be fixed in my own mind if I understand it. Um, it, it began this devolution of the discursive environment with a healthy skepticism of science there had been too much science and uh, science had thrown out too many babies with the bathwater. I'm talking approximately the time of the birth of the human potential movement and the coming on of LSD and all that. What was happening in science at the same time was people were building atom bombs or they were propounding behavioral psychology, ratomorphic theories of behavior. It was a great era of the triumph of reductionism and so forth. And so a whole lot of people wrote deconstructive books and essays about science and trying to link it back to the spiritual. And successfully, in my opinion, probably the most dramatic of these books was Thomas Kuhn's book, probably most of you have read the, the structure of scientific revolutions where he offers the for the time startling proposal and then proves it that modern science is actually based on very woo woo revelations spiritual encounters with aliens people who had uh, visionary dreams and so forth uh, and that the story science likes to tell about how it does its work, which is you take your colleagues' earlier work, you carefully check the facts, you perform experiments, you advance the theory by incrementally advancing hypotheses, which you carefully test. And that's the story you tell once you have the beast dead in the boat. But the real experience of dragging one of these things out of the water is much more dramatic and hair-raising and chance-taking. And for instance, we know now that Gregor Mendel, when he did his experiments with sweet peas, that if he had actually been rigorous in his observations, he would have missed the laws of genetic segregation. The sweet pea doesn't... Uh, quite perform in the theoretical way that Mendel's notebooks seem to show. What he did was he rounded up and rounded down because he already had an intuition that the recessive gene would have a, a certain mathematical characteristic. So he played with the data, data to make the theory right. Well, then it turned out it was right. Uh, but rarely can you play this game and get away with it the way he did. So 
as acid came on in the early late 50s and early 60s and as science reached its most uh, reductionist and obnoxious uh, crescendo there was this healthy skepticism of science it had gone too far you know it was producing atom bombs but not giving us a social psychology or a or a theory of psychoanalysis or anything like that that we could really uh, use. That seemed to be coming from the underground. Uh, what was wrong with uh, science? Well, um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but just as an aside, if you're interested in it, I think it had become too dependent on... Um, on probability theory, on statistical analysis, on certain assumptions in the way it did its mathematical bookkeeping uh, were not apparent to the second and third generation of scientists working in this manner. So when I'm confronted with a historical phenomenon that seems like it's gone off the tracks or gotten into the ditch, my method is to go back through its history to try and find the last sane moment that it knew and then make judgments based on that. Well, I think if you analyze science in that way, uh, the, last, the, the basic idea of science before the rise of probability theory is science is the idea that human beings can uh, understand nature not relate to it, not ritualize it, not worship it, but intellectually encompass it somehow through modeling. And, um, and the, when you try to do this, a rule that quickly forces its uh, limitations upon you is, uh, and it's very basic to the Western mind, is this thing formulated as Occam's razor. William of Occam was a 14th century philosopher who founded a point of view called nominalism. But the thing that Occam said that is germane for this argument is, he said it in Latin, and there's different arguments about exactly what he said, but here's the boil down. What he said was, hypotheses should not be multiplied without necessity or to further boil it down keep it simple stupid or halfway between these two points the sim in all situations the simplest adequate explanation should be preferred so see what this is it's also sometimes called the principle of parsimony parsimony being the simplest and most elegant way of doing something so it's the principle of parsimony that the simplest adequate explanation should always be preferred this is a great idea i don't think you will get into trouble with this idea and to sort of close the loop generated by jim's question uh, this is where the reaction to science has gone wrong the principle of parsimony is now lo no longer now intuitively grasped by other people in other words when you sit down at the table in the dining room to talk about the universe with people you cannot be sure that if you mention this idea whether you called it Occam's razor the principle of parsimony or you just explained what it meant you can't be sure that it would have any intellectual force with people. Somehow people have moved into a Baroque or even Rococo phase in their model building, and they have no problem uh, uh, adding on incredibly improbable and illogical uh, bells, whistles, curlicues, filigrees, fleur-de-lis, paisleys, and what have you, uh, to their thinking and uh, it's it's uh, it's a problem it's a problem for everybody in society what puzzles me is 
it offends me that psychedelic people are um, susceptible to this because it seems to me we're the last people who should be susceptible to this. We have no need of spiritual illusions because we have access to spiritual realities through the substances and the plants. So why should we, least of all, why should we buy in to all these unanchored, woolly, fluff-headed ideas that are being pushed in the spiritual marketplace. The only answer I've been able to come up with is simple proximity. That by the rest of society, we have been lumped in with these people, and they move freely among us, uh, easily detected, but rarely ostracized. Uh, our own tolerance has become uh, our weakness. Uh, and it's this weird political correctness where people do not say what you just said is preposterous. It makes no sense whatsoever. This is just thought so ungenerous of spirit to point out that someone makes no sense at all. It, it's that their feelings, I think, have become preeminent in the value system. It's more important not to hurt someone's feelings than to let them walk around with a head full of crap. So uh, having identified this as a problem and having never been terribly sensitive to other people's feelings <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I was a good person <laughs> to uh, send to the ramp. The, the, but the consequences of this are not good. In other words, if we really want to build a, um, a sane and caring world, we can't do it uh, based on illusion, uh, unanchored thinking, and just plain silliness. It's very hard. You know, the world is in the hands of very hard-eyed and practical people. They have learned that by owning the planet, you can make money. They are not going to easily step away from the wheel. They are going to have to be presented with an overwhelming argument or circumstance for them to go quietly into retirement. And by vitiating the thrust of critical thinking with this cult of generalized political correctness, uh, we weaken our case for uh, a new way of, of running the world. 